Okay, uh, so one of the reasons why I changed the name of this Miniconf between its last iteration and this one uh, from a programming Miniconf to a developer's Miniconf was so that we could have uh, talks about tools and processes that uh, developers use uh, when making software. And uh, one of the tools that lots of people use but probably don't understand how it works or how to make it work is Git. And yet we seem to use that every single day in our in our day-to-day -day, uh, day -day, uh, lives as, uh, as developers. So with that in mind, our next presenter is going to be teaching us how to understand Git, even the scary bits. Uh, please welcome Anwesha Chatterjee. All right. Um, thanks for coming, everyone. But um, yeah, so just wanted to talk about Git because about two years ago when I first started using Git, I was very cautious about what commands I used and um, how I used the tool. I think I'd basically just restrict myself to things like commit, pull, push. If anything went wrong, I'd panic and just restart. Um, but I think over the years, like two years, <laughs> I've um, pushed myself past the um, basic git commands and uh, familiarize myself with the more difficult um, concepts like rebasing and merging. And in order to do that, I had to look under the hood and really understand it, even the scary parts. So I'd like to um, start by talking a little bit about my journey so far. So two years ago, started as um, a graduate software engineer at Boeing, and um, I had never used um, Git before, so like n not for the purposes of collaboration, but yeah, so as a result, I was very scared. Um, I basically used a lot of abstraction tools available in IDs like PyCharm to not look not have to look at how Git actually works, um, like not have to do anything on this like command line, for example. Um, the other thing, uh, the reason why I'm talking about Bitbucket is it, it's got a similar code review model to GitHub, um, pull request model, sorry, um, to GitHub. And um, so if you, for example, want to create a pull request you'd um, be able to have more than one commit associated with the pull request, both in Bitbucket and GitHub. So often I do things like, if, if there was a, a commit with a typo in it, I'd just be able to push another commit with the typo fix instead of actually amending the commit or rebasing it, which um, is pretty bad practice. Um, my commit messages were, like, just on a side note, pretty, pretty bad. Not as bad as this. Um, pretty close, but <laughs> found this online. I thought this was pretty cool. Um, if you wanted some inspiration on, like, how to not write messages. Yeah. <laughs> so there's more. I had to, like, PG that. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, recently, six months ago, started as a software engineer at Red Hat. Um, and I work on the open source Beaker project, so um, it's a little bit more stringent as to how um, we use Git. Um, we use Garrett for code reviews. Um, basically, basically with Garrett, you only have um, you're only allowed one commit per code review. So if you make a mistake, you have to amend it. Um, and so um, that was one of the things. Um, also, say you branched off of uh, master and someone changed something in master that now conflicts with your pull request, you'd have to rebase it rather than merge it because I'll cover this later, but merge creates a merge commit. Uh, you can't have that because then it creates another code review. So I think it really enforced a lot of good practice um, so I think I'm less scared of Git now. Um, right. 
things we'll cover today is how Git works under the hood with its storage, what a branch is, and then once we've covered that, figuring out rebase and merge and how they're different and how they're similar. Storage, right. High level view of how Git storage works. So blob is um, basically the way Git represents every file in a repository, every version of every file in a repository because that's what it is, right? Um, so it um, stands for binary large object. We don't, don't need to know much about it. Just know that when you have a file in a repository, Git looks at it as a blob. <coughs> then there's the tree object. This basically creates, a, like has a list or inventory of every file that is there in the repository and it maps it to each one of these blobs. So it's got pointers, the tree object has pointers to each of these blobs. Um, and yeah, it has some other information like access modes and stuff. So um, yeah, the commit object is the main one. So it's got a lot of commit metadata like the committer information, the author information, all of that. Um, and it uh, points to the tree object. This is how it can create a snapshot of a repository at any point. Um, and the other thing that the commit object also does is it, it points to the previous commits or the parent commits. Um, so it basically looks like that. So every commit has an associated snapshot and it points to its previous commits it, unless it's like the initial commit of a repository or it can also have two parents if it's a merge commit, but we'll cover that. Um, so yeah, now that you know that about how it works with storage, let's look at how branches are, uh, branches work. Um, so a branch is basically a lightweight movable pointer um, on a certain uh, commit node. And basically when you're on a branch and you add another commit, pointer automatically moves. Um, you can have multiple branches and I'm sure uh, most of you who have used Git would have um, like had many branches off of um, a repository. Basically, those are all just um, different pointers and um, the way you can tell, um, in, a Git can tell where you're sitting at any point is using the head ref. It's basically a ref uh, sorry, a pointer to the branch, which is also a pointer. So pointer to a pointer. Right, so armed with this knowledge of how Git, Git storage and branch works, let's take a look at rebasing and merging. See how it um, is similar or different and what to do. Uh, we'll also cover what to do and what not to do. Don't do this, um, we'll cover this later on, <laughs> but um, just, just know that do not push force. Right, so um, this is a situation after creating a, a branch. So you've got um, a my feature branch, which points at the same commit that master does. And now, uh, another uh, developer on your team has pushed commit D onto master branch, but you're still sitting on commit C. So let's try merging. Now, that's easy because you hadn't done any work yet, so all it had to do was move the pointer to the latest commit in master. And um, that's called a fast forward merge. Um, that term might have come up a few times but yeah, that was easy. But situation when you've got another commit on my feature branch and master has uh, commit D as well, what happens after merging then is it creates a commit F, the red one, which is the merge commit that ties in the history from my feature branch and master branch. 
And so essentially, you have both of the history from those branches in a tree sort of sort of stitching pattern format. So yeah, if you if you keep doing that, um, if you keep merging in master and there's other changes in master, this will this is what it'll look like. The red ones are the merge commits. So back to the original case where both your branch and master have commits. If you try rebasing this time, what happens is git creates another commit which is um, the green one. Basically, what that is, is the changes that you had introduced in commit E, taken from commit E and based on top of commit D. So it's a different commit. So if you look at, like, so the commit hash is the identifier for a git commit. The hash would be different. The end result is the same as a merge. But what happens is commit E originally, um, that was on commit C, it, it gets garbage collected because it it's, doesn't serve any, more, any purpose, and it's a more linear history once commit E is removed. So same result, but yeah, um, looks different. So the things to remember is, yeah, they achieve the same thing. They not, might not be doing the same thing, but merge results in a more stitching pattern sort of look and rebase results in a more linear um, history. Um, definitely uh, check out interactive rebase if you uh, would like to look more into the powers of rebase. And at this point, I was going to start putting in a lot of like screenshots, but I realized that I could just demo what it does and what could go wrong. So yeah, <laughs> right. I'm gonna try and do this. <laughs> Chris, is there a way to like look at what I'm doing? <laughs> Sorry. Maybe. Yeah. Otherwise. V, is there a confidence mode that we can switch on at the front, or do we have nothing? I could do this as well. No idea. Okay, Sorry. that's all good. I'll just like, sorry, this side of the room. <laughs> but yeah, I'll just um, try and work like this. So um, let me create a directory called um, soup. And let me initialize that as a Git repository. Now, adding a file called soup.txt, where I'll keep all my ingredients to the Git repository. Now, automatically, when you're in a repository um, and you commit something, it will create a master branch. So you're automatically on master branch. Now, say I'd like to um, create another branch called pumpkin soup, where I'll keep my pumpkin soup needs. Oh, oh, sorry. Doesn't. Yeah, OK. So now I'm on pumpkin soup branch. Um, let me now make some changes to soup.txt. It's got nothing in it because I didn't put anything in it. But yeah, I'll add that. And say. So similarly, if I were to add onions, make the same commit. Right. So now, if I were to take a look at my logs, <coughs> I'll see the original commit from master, then pumpkin and onions. That's what I expect. Say now I realize that in most of my soups, I'll need veg stock. So in master, I add veg stock. Right, and now 
going back to my other branch, say I'd like to merge my changes from master, um, what happens then? So I'll have a conflict because there's changes in both of the, both of the branches, like I said earlier. So this is what it originally looked like. There was nothing in it, which is what I expect. Um, master added red stock, and I added pumpkin and onions. So I resolved that. I add the resolution, and then I commit it. So this basically, oh, there's a very cool way of looking at the logs. If you pass in one git, uh, git log graph one line all, it'll show you in the command line how, what it looks like um, in terms of branches. So you can see that you had like pumpkin and onions in the pumpkin uh, soup branch, and then it got in the commit from master. Um, yeah, and uh, basically this commit out here is the merge commit, the red commit that I was talking about earlier. Right. Um, another really, so I want to show what um, rebase looks like. So another really cool um, thing that Git has, which I didn't know about before and is really helpful, is reflog. Um, so if I want to reset to a previous stage, I've completely messed up my um, repository. I want to reset to a previous um, state. For example, I would like to reset to onions when I first added onions in this branch. So obviously hard is going to make all, uh, like clear up all the changes after that point. So be very sure that you want to reset hard. But yeah, at this point, if I look at the log, it's again only got this um, adding and then pumpkin and then onions. And um, it didn't, it got rid of all the merging and all of that. So that's what I want. This time, let's try rebasing onto master. Now, um, interactive rebase is basically um, when you pass in like I and it opens up the um, commit um, sort of message and everything. So you can do many different things. Um, like you can um, squash two commits together. Um, fix up is like squash, but you like don't have both the messages. But yeah, these are really cool. Try these out. Um, I'll um, talk a little bit more about them later if I have time. But yeah, um, basically, let me continue the rebase. I have a merge conflict because, again, I have changes in both the files. So yeah, this is just sitting on the first commit, the pumpkin commit. So it doesn't have the onions yet. So I know how to resolve this. Resolved. Add the resolution and continue. So that's all rebased. Now, if you were to take a look, firstly, at the commit numbers right here, I might even like quickly write down the commit numbers just so. So yeah, um, onions has EB4E, um, pumpkins has 4A91, the commit hashes. Um, just taking a look now at what it looks like after the rebase. Graph one line all. You see it's more linear now? It's, it's linear now. Um, in merging, you'd have a merge commit. It doesn't have a merge commit. Also, it's linear. But the important thing to note here is my onion um, commit that was EB4E now um, starts with 44D5, and my pumpkin commit, which was 4A91, starts with 5828. So they're different commits, but they do the same, the same thing. So that was a little um, demo of how to um, rebase. There's a few different tools that you can use um, that can make your life easier with rebasing and just in general conflict resolu resolution. I use a different diff style, diff3, which also shows the common ancestor. I think I often use the common ancestor of um, uh, you know, a file with a conflict to resolve the conflict. Um, some people might not need that, but definitely 
like that. Or re 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 is really cool. Whenever you, if you find yourself um, making the same resolutions again and again, um, uh, then it's really good to have that because it records a certain um, conflict resolution and then applies it again. So definitely look into re re re. Um, one big word of warning with rebase is do not do this on a branch that other people are working on. Do it on your personal branch, but what that will do is it'll make it seem, because it changes the commits, it'll make it seem that like everyone else and you have um, diverged, your branches have diverged, even though it, that the same changes, there's ways to get out of it, but it's very messy and it's just extra work and no one needs that. So do, if, if you're unsure about it, do not rebase it and also do not push force like I in that meme earlier because that'll do exactly the same thing. Push force is when you've pushed something, is used when you've pushed something that you weren't supposed to, but if you force the changes into the remote, it's just going to look like it's changed for you, but anyone else who's working off that branch is still going to have um, the commits. Like, it's not going to magically change um, all the commits in other people's branches, so it's going to look like it's diverged. So be careful when you use these um, tools, but don't be scared. I think Git is very forgiving um, because for the most part, it's really easy to get out of trouble. You can't, you can't lose a commit. If you look at reflog, for example, you can always go back to a state where you, know, you, it, you can like cherry pick the, another commit that you seem to have lost. There's, there's ways to get out of trouble. Um, if you're worried about uh, any um, re rebase that's messy, just try it out on a branch and delete it later on. And yeah, use reflog. Get very um, familiar with reflog. I think I've definitely, my life has been easier since I've started using it. Um, I'll firstly thank you, um, Chris, and everyone else for coming. But yeah, Qu questions. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, thanks, Anwesha. Yeah. <laughs> I think we have a few minutes for questions. So if you have a question, put your hand up and I will run a microphone over to you. Yes. Thanks, Anwesha. What was the moment that changed you from being nervous about Git, because that's where I am, Okay. <laughs> to, to jumping and going, yeah, I can do this? Like, what's, what was the switch for you? I think realizing that I can try things in a branch by myself, mess it up completely, and just restart it using reflog from, you know, just the first, like, square one, that was it. I think that's what really encouraged me to get my hands dirty. And then just, if, if something goes um, entirely wrong, there's, there's so much information available on the internet. Because once, once you know exactly where it broke, Stack Overflow <laughs> helps out. <laughs> yeah. Reflog. I know. It, yeah, you read it like reflog, but no, it's reflog. <laughs> okay, I think we've got one more question up here. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, one thing I struggle with very often is reading the conflict files. Yes. Like how Git shows. Yeah, these are the differences, but I have a hard time finding out, like, so I need to go and, I guess, look up the commit hashes to understand this is what I added, this is what yeah. was removed. Do you yeah. have any tips for that? Like, how do you sort of... You right. Um, I, I like to stick to the um, command line now because for so long I didn't, and I find that if, as, like, if I'm working on a server or something, I, I need to stick to it. So I, I don't know, like, um, one of the things that I would do is... Um, you know, if it's two changes between two uh, commits that are not the last commit, I'll put in the hashes. And um, so this next one, and it shows me the diff li like that. And um, if it's like multi-page, you can search for a particular term that you're looking in the in the diff. Um, but yeah, is that what you were asking? Like. Uh, yeah, yeah. We can definitely talk about this more because I, I can go on about it. So, yeah, in the hallway. <laughs> uh, doesn't look like we have any more questions. 
Oh, we have one more, so now I have to go running all the way over here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Marcus. Uh, I like to do everything that's given. One question would probably be very subjective, but if you worked in an IDE on your desktop, um, would you have an IDE that integrates with Git like Atom, or would you go back to a command line to make all your pushes and commits? Um, I think personally, because a lot of my work happens on different um, VMs on, and different like servers, I have tried to stay away from um, um, IDEs for Git purposes. I still use it for other development, but I find that the more comfortable I get with the Git um, CLI, uh, the more um, like it, the easier my life is going to be in the future. So um, while I, I think there's a lot of powerful tools out there, Git K, I think, like it's not an IDE, but like there's a lot of tools that you can use that abstract Git out for you. Um, I think personally, I'd rather understand how it works first and then learn the abstractions. Okay. Um, thank you for your talk. It, uh, I think it's going to save a whole lot of us from, from doing silly things with Git in the future. So. Uh, <laughs> Uh, certainly, if I'd heard it uh, back when I started using Git, I wouldn't have accidentally pushed a three-year-old master uh, using push-f. Oh, yeah. um, so thank you for that. Uh, everybody, please thank Anwesha for a great talk. Uh,